everyone, and welcome to another episode of What's the Difference podcast. I'm your host, Jackie Rosen. Today, we are joined by my co-host, Sarah Patel. Hey, everyone. And today's topic is going to be body shaming. Now, it is a very broad topic, and we know we could probably talk about this for hours. So we're going to keep it to just a few questions today. And on our panel, we have Nikki Crow, who is a return guest. Hello, thanks for having me back. Um, I was on your episode on breast cancer, and uh, it was a great experience. It's nice to be back here with you. Oh, we're really happy to have you. And we have a new guest today who is a friend of Sarah's. Welcome, Kia Osborne. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm Kia Osborne. I work for CNAB, and how I know Sarah, I know from the site loss community through trailblazers and other great um, activities and also she's a participant uh, I do youth programming for CNIB so she's one of my participants and she's amazing. Now this is a topic that we actually started to touch on when Nikki was on an episode last season talking about her experience with breast cancer and about how constantly we are getting shame from all angles and including doctors and nurses and people in medical facilities. So we thought it was time for a bigger discussion on the subject. So my first question, and I guess I will go to, we can start with Nikki, is um, what are some of your earliest memories of having to deal with body shaming and where did the shaming come from? Um, well, I think the very first ones were in school, of course, kids bully each other. Um, but I was also shamed by my doctor from a very young age. And the focus wasn't even on health. It was more just on my weight all the time. Um, yeah, just, you know, even when I was four or five, it was you need to lose weight, you need to lose weight. And I know a lot of people have had that same experience. It must be really hard at the age of four to, you know, to have professionals tell you you need to lose weight and, and, you know, your mom or your parents need to monitor your food intake. Yeah. And the thing as well is I was a, a chubby child, but I wasn't that big. And I was also very active. Um, my mom cooked from scratch. So we ate pretty healthy. Um, and as we're learning more and more, like genetics have a lot to do with body size. So in my case, it wasn't like, I guess my doctor was trying to put out this, like, you need to exercise more, you need to eat less. But those were things that I was already doing. And it was just how my body was. Mm -hmm. What about your experience, Kia? So my ex experience, um, again, too, in school, because um, I was always very thin. So being ostracized or being too thin, because um, I'm naturally lean, uh, still am, now that I'm getting older, putting on a little bit of pounds, which is okay. Uh, but culturally, so my background is from Trinidad. So the Caribbean uh, beauty standard is a more voluptuous, um, curvy woman. So from family, you know, at a young age, you know, family members would make fun. Other uh, friends, you know, Caribbean friends would make fun because, again, I, I, I didn't have the shapely, the shapely hips and the butt and, you know, the curvy, you know, the, the ample bosom. Um, so, you know, my legs, I have a bit of a knock knee. So I, you know, bony knees. So they would make fun of my knees and so I, I didn't really fit their standard of beauty. So it was something that I always carried with me because I, I always fought to, to try and emulate that. Again, I tried to eat more and, you know, I'll do weights to really create, you know, build more muscle, which I'm happy I, I have that. But I, I want to emulate that standard of beauty because that's something that mattered to me. But as I've gotten older, you know, again, you have that body acceptance. Yeah. And I think that does happen as, you know, as you get more away from your school years and away from kids be kids teasing you and all that. So Kia, can you talk about some of the racial origins of fat stigma and how, how did this impact you? So again, as I mentioned, my background is Caribbean. So Trinid uh, Trinidadian. So in that society, or, you know, their standard of beauty is totally different from the Eurocentric uh, standard of beauty, where, again, in growing up, I uh, grew up in Montreal, I'm Canadian. So, again, their standard is, you know, a slender, a slender build, 
Um, of course, well, I'm not blonde or blue eyed. So that was the Euro the Eurocentric, but when it came to my body type, um, I fit the North American sound of beauty as where it comes from. When you look at, you know, again, African or Caribbean, their standards are totally different. They want a, you know, again, a more voluptuous, your, your standard is a more voluptuous. You have the curvy, the hips, the, the you know, a, you know, rounded butt, you know, shapely, leg, very shapely legs, ample bosom. So again, curvy and a, a, more of a thicker woman, and that's their standard. That's what they, they that, that that's the kind of woman they appreciate. So when they see my body type, I'm I guess I'm going against the grain. I don't fit that stereotypical, um, you know, Afrocentric body type. I don't have you know I'm more of an athletic build. I've never had the the big butt. I mean, I've always wanted one. It was great. It's beautiful. I mean, for, for me personally, I think it's 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 beautiful because that's my culture. But because I never, um, I never, I guess I didn't represent that body type. I was ostracized or again made fun of. So again, the they're they're totally polar opposites when it comes to that. You know the the racial standard of beauty from you know from a Caribbean standpoint and the North. American Eurocentric standpoint. Coming from an Asian background, like an Indian background, normally, you know, girls are really like slim, straight fit body and not that tall. And I was the opposite. I was curvy. I have an hourglass body. I was like always tall for my age because I'm like, I have my upper torso is a lot smaller than like my lower half. Like I'm all legs in the, in the European or Western society. I could go into modeling, but not like in um, the culture and whatnot but for me it was really hard because everyone would always kind of compare me like oh look she has wide hips and she's got you know she's she's really tall compared to x y and z and I just didn't fit the normal or like the society cultural norm of body image yeah and I think that there's I think what we've seen a lot of change in our lifetimes and I know like Nikki and I and of course, Nikki and I are old friends dating back to grade two. So Nikki and I lived through a time where in the early 2000s, when we were teenagers, where, you know, your what we saw in the media was basically Kate Moss, which was a stick. And, you know, that was really hard to live through that time while we were in high school. And I, because of my medical issues, I was a stick, but I never wanted to be like that. And it's funny because I was trying to fight against what popular culture wanted because I knew that slim for me meant not well. And so I always wanted to gain weight. That was always my goal was gaining weight. Now I'm going to ask both of you and actually and Sarah as well. How do you think that pop culture messaging in North America has kind of changed as we've gotten older? Do you, th have you seen a change? What kind of have you noticed? One thing that I have noticed with pop culture, there's definitely been a shift more recently. There are some bigger bodies portrayed in the media. There is more availability of plus size clothing and things like that, especially on Instagram. There is a huge uh, community for body support, like body positivity, embracing all bodies, not just big bodies, but all bodies. Also in stores, I see more including more sizes of bodies. Like I, I don't want to name any brands in particular, but there is a very popular teen brand that now has a big range of bodies on their website and in their branding, which back when we were in high school, that's something that you would never see. And I guess for people who don't know us, we were in high school about 20 years ago. <laughs> so that was quite a while ago. And actually, Jackie, what you said about um, wanting to go against the popular culture image, because for you, it meant you were unwell. I thought that that was such a good point because a lot of people tend to associate unhealthiness with bigger bodies, whereas in reality, there's not necessarily a correlation. There could be people who are bigger, who are healthy and people who are smaller, who are unhealthy. So in your case, you always associated thinness with being unhealthy. And I thought that was such an important point because we get into this idea that to be healthy, you have to have this perfect thin body. And that's not necessarily the case. No, no. And I mean, 
the years that I spent trying to, you know, eat that extra chocolate bar just to gain weight. And then I would still be burning it off faster than I would be taking anything in. And it really took until my thirties where I started actually gaining weight and it started sticking. And that was just, I think my metabolism changed. And now I'm actually considered, my BMI is actually considered overweight, which is, uh, again, it's, I just had a baby. So, I mean, that could be why, but, but it's, it, you know, it's funny that the attitude shift for me now is going, and this is, again, this is pop culture draining into my brain from like probably more from 20 years ago going, oh my God, I'm overweight now. I have to lose weight. I have to lose weight. I have to lose weight. And nobody should be pressuring anyone like that, especially not, you know, somebody who just had a baby and it's, it's weird going from the other side being from, you know, I do anything to gain. And now it's like, well, I try to find every little thing I can do to lose. That's part of fat phobia, being afraid of gaining weight because society is telling us, no, absolutely not. You shouldn't be gaining weight. So even when it comes to pregnancy, people get so panicked about how much they're gaining and afterwards, how quickly they're losing. I I agree with what's being said. The other um, spectrum, what's happening with, again, with pop culture, you know, which we're seeing portrayed on Instagram, you know, that artificial Kardashian body where everyone now wants to have the booty uh, rounded, you know, voluptuous, but manufactured where again, these, you know, again, I'm going to use the Kardashians as an example. Um, I mean, they have appropriated a body type where, which is, traditionally seen, you know, again, you're seeing South Asian, Black, Central and, you know, South and Central American, you know, the Brazilians, you know, they, they have that natural voluptuous build. And, and with that pop culture, they're influencing young women, uh, young girls to emulate this artificial body type, which is, again, not healthy, because again, you're, it's all about getting the, having the plastic surgery to attain the unattainable. So that's another uh, side of body acceptance or body shame where you're trying to achieve the unattainable, which again, that's not your physiological look. That's not how you were built. And, you know, again, these popular icons are constantly perpetuating this abnormal body type. So funny you bring up the Kardashians, Kia, because growing up or when I was a teenager, you know, I was told I have the Kardashian butt or I have the Kardashian um, body shape and I did not want that. And I wanted the opposite. And even till this day, like my friends, like everyone is doing what they can to have a Kardashian body figure and you have it and you don't want that so it's always you know what you don't have that's what you want and it's not embracing what you do have and to to your point Sarah you need to correct them by saying I don't have a Kardashian body I have a traditional I'm proud of my heritage I'm South Asian this is the body type I have this is the natural beautiful body type I have and I'm embracing it Kardashians are manufactured so yeah. that's where you need to really be adamant. And again, like you said, you're embracing your body, which your curves are beautiful. Um, and to be compared to these, you know, to these uh, popular icons, you know, again, you have to dismantle that right away. Mm-hmm. I agree. What you were saying, Sarah, about being unhappy with your body. I think that we're so conditioned not even just to want to look a certain way, but just to be unhappy with our bodies. It's like, I've seen cases where women are happy with their bodies and, you know, they're showing that and they're so proud and people think that there's something wrong. Like, oh, why is she so happy? You know? For sure. And I think it's what, you know, because we follow social media so much. And, you know, when you're even standing in line at the grocery store, magazines are right front and center so you're seeing these models and these figures and and you know so it's just I feel like it's constantly in your face in your in your line of sight that even if you are not feeling self-conscious about your body type you start to eventually kind of question especially like winter comes summer everyone now wants that summer body and so they're going to do what they can to bring out their summer body by going to the gym or exercising or whatever they're doing and I think like that you said Nikki they are being a little bit more I don't want to like friendlier so we are seeing other body types and not just that slim shape 
but I think like more needs to be done and like your body comes in all shapes and sizes and it's how everyone is just built differently you know yeah absolutely we have so far to go before all body types are really accepted by the media and portrayed as it should be. And I mean, we are getting there. there. There's more progress than there was 20 years ago when, Nikki, when you and I were in high school. There's definitely progress on this. But you're right. It's still a far way to go. Now, I guess all three of you can answer this question. How did your disabilities factor into your body image? I'll take a, a go at that question. Uh, so again, with my disability, so I'll disclose I'm, I have sight loss. So no sight in the left. I'm a low partial. I guess with when it came to having, you know, with my sight loss growing up, again, I grew up in Montreal, grew up in the 80s. They didn't have the accessibility when it comes to accessible sports the way they do now. Great. Having to try to, you know, again, interact and get involved in sports. It was hard because, again, I've always loved team sports or individual sports that I can, you know, try to keep fit just to be healthy, not about fighting to change my body, but being healthy, being active, and also that social aspect. That was hard. It was a bit of a, it was a deterrent. But as I got older, and again, I, I really immersed myself with the sight loss community. I think it really helped in and also having supportive, I have to say, having supportive friends, uh, able-bodied and from the disab- disability community, um, having friends to always encourage to get me involved in, you know, get in trailblazers, which again, that's great to keep you keep in shape, get, you know, get your cardiovascular strong legs. Um, I've competed in fitness competitions where again, I've had sighted guide help me, you know, crossing the stage or even getting involved in, in bodybuilding and having coaches that were able to accommodate, you know, due to my, you know, accommodate the sport or the exercises based on my disability. So I'm able to accomplish, but having the support system really helped in help you know, with my body image and, having a positive body image and encouraging myself and being an example for others to really get involved in fitness and, and being happy with what, you know, again, you can enhance little things about yourself, but being happy internally about your body and, you know, just being, always being encouraged. I guess in my case, I'll speak to my experience having breast cancer. So that was more recent. That wasn't while I was growing up. That was just in my thirties. I was diagnosed at 34 So in my case, it was actually really hard dealing with body image issues, going through breast cancer because your body does change so much. I know I had expected that I would lose weight during treatment because a lot of people do, but a lot of people also gain weight, which isn't something that's really talked about. And in my case, I did gain weight. So that was very hard for me because I was already overweight. And to deal with even more weight gain, it really took a toll on my body image. I definitely had doctors that were talking to me about it. And I think in the last podcast episode we did, I talked about the nurse who was telling me like, you need to eat healthy. You need to do this. You need to do this. And it was things that I was already doing. It just, the medication can make you gain weight. Also, when I went through surgery and I had a mastectomy, Like that just kind of destroyed my body image, which I wasn't expecting. And in that case, it really triggered flare up of my eating disorder that I had dealt with for so many years. So that was really hard to go through as well. Yeah. And even the next course of chemo I had, I gained even more weight. So it was just really hard to deal with gaining weight when there was nothing I could do about it. And then having all this feedback saying that I should be losing weight, like no matter how I do it, just not like basically fighting against what was happening to my body at the time. Yeah. I I imagine like the last thing that you need when you're going through grueling cancer treatments and you were, were you every two weeks? I can't remember now. Every two weeks for chemo? In the beginning, the first cycle, I was every three weeks. And then when I did oral chemotherapy, I was two weeks on, one week off. So that's, I mean, basically at that point, you're in survival mode at that yeah. point. Yeah. Um, you can't worry about what you're eating or what you're doing as far as exercises. You just need to wake up every day and survive. And when, when you hear about what you should be doing, what you should be doing here, what you should be doing there, all that, 
it's really, really hard. I can kind of, I mean, I guess like pregnancy is a totally different thing, but because my pregnancy was so difficult and so challenging, I was like that at that, at that point, it was just like, you know what, uh, I'm going to eat what I want to eat because I just need to get up and survive today. And that's all. And I just need to keep surviving till I get to the point that my child is born. And then I got to survive a little bit longer after that too. So I stopped caring what I was eating. And I, I actually ate more healthy during my pregnancy than I've ever eaten in my life. But it was like, you know, it's, it wasn't, the thought wasn't about, well, you know, I, I remember somebody telling me, well, you should really stop eating that chocolate bar or, you know, you should cut it in half. And I'm like, no, I'm nauseous all day. Eating's the only thing that makes me feel happy. Let me eat my chocolate bar. You know, it's, it is a small survival. So when I hear about people being criticized when they're going through a particularly medically rough time, that's just not the time to do it. That's just the time that, you know, what you're doing is adding more trauma and more stuff that we're going to have to speak to a psychiatrist about later in life because we're going to be traumatized by it. Yeah. And it definitely what added more stress to what I was going through because, you know, at one point, when I mentioned I had a flare up of an eating disorder, I really wasn't eating. I was eating like maybe two bananas a day and that was it for like a long period of time. But because I was overweight, doctors, I guess, wouldn't really think that that was a problem. So when I did lose a little weight during my treatment, I was praised for that, even though I said I was having difficulty eating because I was so depressed and, you know, this was going on. Um, But also like alternatively, um, when I was gaining weight it did add an extra struggle to it because like you know you only have so much energy when you're going through something like that and I needed to focus that energy on my kids so I wasn't using that energy necessarily to work out and I was still eating pretty healthy but some of the medication like it just makes you gain weight and that's just what it does okay so Nikki you just touched on this about eating disorders so I thought I would open the floor to people if they're if they're comfortable sharing about a history with eating disorders. I really started getting into dieting when I was about 11 years old. I would diet and I did lose quite a bit of weight and maintained it throughout like my teenage years. But at the end of my teenage years, that's when I really started struggling. And I lost about 80 pounds in maybe four months because I just wasn't eating. I was starving myself and it just was, I guess, a really scary time, a really not good time. But at the same time, I was being praised because in the beginning, I wasn't overweight, but I was like at the end of, I guess, BMI spectrum, you know, Mm -hmm. of what is a normal weight. And I just, you know, got to underweight. And I was being praised the whole time for losing this weight. And I did sort of recover from that. And I did gain a lot of weight afterwards, which was very difficult to go through. And I still struggled for many years with that. But because I was overweight, it wasn't as noticeable. So I wasn't getting support for that. I was actually afraid to ask for help dealing with it. Because I thought that anyone, any doctor or therapist who would talk to me would be like, well, what is she talking about? Because I guess there's this image and even the criteria for being diagnosed back when I did have an eating disorder was that you were not considered like a real issue unless you um, were under a 17.5 BMI or so basically you were emaciated or you lost your periods and if you didn't have that you weren't taken seriously at all. And even now I still do struggle. I mentioned while I was going through um, cancer treatment, that was something that came up for me. Um, I struggled for many years in there, I guess. And it's something I still do struggle with now, but I guess now it's, if I do lose weight, it's being encouraged and nobody seems to worry about what I'm doing to lose that weight and not even just like in my situation I know a lot of women and men too have had situations where because they're overweight even if they're doing the same behaviors they're not eating enough they're making themselves throw up they're doing something very damaging to their body it's not taken seriously and Nikki I was just going to jump in quickly with the fact that you said that they were only you know looking into it if it was 
under 17.5 BMI or if you a girl lost her period. And it's interesting that you make it, you know, the girl that you said the girl lost her period because it's like, especially if it's a male doctor, that gets into the whole other subject of kind of, well, the male doctors only care when women are too skinny to have babies or something like that. You know, that's the first thing that popped into my head. Yeah, I mean, a lot of doctors just weren't aware that it was an issue unless you were under a certain size. And that has changed. They did change the criteria for diagnosing eating disorders, but most doctors still don't take it seriously until like, unless you're very, very small or have starved yourself down to a certain point, but there's lots of people who are still overweight and they're struggling with eating and not necessarily even overeating because people will assume, oh, well, they must be overeating. Um, no, they're starving themselves. And some people, even while starving themselves, they either don't do it for a long enough period that they're losing crazy amount of weight or their body just is not losing the weight for one reason or another. It's just not how their body is. Like everyone has this idea of, you know, weight loss is calories in versus calories out, but it's really not as simple as that. I think that's going into a whole nother topic, but yeah, yeah. So that's what the, the going idea is that if you are eating under what you're burning, you're going to lose weight. Um, well, I can't speak to um, eat the first. I don't, I don't have one. Uh, but when it comes to when you're talking about, you know, calorie deficit, especially I'm just going to reflect back to when I actually competed and, you know, aesthetically, because that's another sport where you have to have a specific body type. You're looking for a specific body type when you're competing to achieve that you have to be in a calorie deficit. So you're actually going through not yo-yo dieting per se, but you're going through specific regimens of diet. So you have to count macros or you have to count your calories. So let's say if you're building muscle, you're almost overeating, which at first sounds great, but it's, it's very, it's very stressful. It can be, again, it's almost like, it's almost, I mean, like a, almost an emotional eat type <laughs> type scenario, depending on, you know, what your mindset is. It's, it's cause you're building, building, and you have to force yourself to eat more to attain muscle. Then you go through that cutting phase where again, you're in a caloric deficit and you're doing, you know, different diets. There's a ketogenic diet, you're cutting calories. And again, to achieve that look, which again, it's not attainable. So, um, I mean, I've, I've done it, so I've lived the experience and, you know, it, it, the, the positives of it is that you're challenging yourself to achieve a specific body type, but again, it's, it's not sustainable. Um, and, and having a good, a positive relationship with food, um, don't, I'm, I'm one of those, I don't deprive myself, never did, never will. Um, sometimes I emotionally eat. So, you know, I'll break out the popcorn and go at it. And I know, okay, there's a reason behind it. So, you know, I identify. So mm -hmm. again, want to make sure I have that healthy relationship with food and I allow myself to, you know, again, if there's, I mean, especially what's happening now with COVID, you know, everybody's going through uh, different mental health issues. I know personally, and I'm, you know, I don't mind disclosing. I've, I'm an emotional eater. I will break out the chips, break out the popcorn, and I will just go. Which, again, after you know, you go, you, you you go through that that feeling, then you have to identify why am I why am I overeating? Does it make me feel good? If it doesn't, okay. So we have to try and get to the root of the problem because you always want to have again a positive relationship with food and. And again, that word diet is so dangerous. Yes. And Kia, what you were saying about um, the positive relationship with food, like it's such a great thing that you were saying um, you don't deprive yourself because yeah. I think in, in Western culture, there's this idea that almost depriving ourselves of food um, is almost like showing strength. You're strong because you can deprive yourself of food and you can lose this weight or attain a certain body image. And you were also saying that it's not attainable necessarily. Um, 
and that's such a good point. Um, I'm kind of circling a few different points here right now, but yes, like the healthy relationship with food, it doesn't necessarily only mean eating when you're hungry and stopping when you're full, like there's cultural, um, parts to food. There's, if you, there's foods that can bring you comfort. And especially now during COVID, like some people just need that comfort food or, you know, they want to have a meal with somebody else. And like, there, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. I think that's part of a healthy relationship with food. We touched on, on a lot, a lot of great points. Um, I think one thing I want to say from experience is every, you know, if you struggle with a eating disorder or disordered eating, there's so many various reasons. We've only touched on a few reasons why people or individuals struggle with it. And I think from experience, I can say it's a lifelong struggle. It's not something, it's not something that you can go for treatment and come out and you'll be fine. It's something that you'll constantly be dealing with in your life on and off. I think it's like the same as like overcoming alcohol, right? It's like you're constantly checking in with yourself and, and you know, and like, putting that craving down and it's the same thing when it comes to a bit when it comes to disordered eating or it is eating disorders for me you know since I was very um I was tall I don't think I was really on the chubby side but I felt I was or because just the way I was criticized or or looked at and so I did whatever I could in my youth um to kind of fit in another thing coming from a Muslim background you know we're supposed to be covering our chest and our bums so it's like okay well if I have a smaller boobs you know it's less I have to cover make sure I'm covering myself um, and making sure I'm not wearing such tight clothes and things like that but what for me what it turned into is being in control so you know it it was a lot of times when you feel like things are going out of control or out of your hands, this is just unfortunately one way, you know, some people turn to, okay, I can control the amount of food that I'm going to be putting into my body or not putting into my body. And it's, you know, yes, I've gotten, I would say better, um, or I came to a, a manageable or maintainable um, weight and then ever since my accident since December things kind of took a spiral and it's something I didn't do on purpose but all of a sudden I've like lost a lot of weight and um I never planned to do it it just it just happened and so now I have it okay you know you're you're too you're too slim like look at you you look like you're blah 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 and there, I think there is really no, I, at least for me, I feel like there is really no like happy place or, or, or people around you where there's this happy place. Like before I would take that very personally, but now I'm just like, you know what? I don't care. I'm happy of where I am. Yes, definitely. I need to get to the root of the problem and, and see why, what's happening for whatever reason. But I've also acknowledged that it's going to be a lifelong struggle and especially with, you know, society and culture. And there's just so many things out there that any point in time you can be doing well and then something can trigger it. Or, you know, if you're stressed out, like, for, so when I'm stressed out, I'm the opposite. Like, I, I don't want to look at food. I don't want to eat. Like, I just, that, that, that's just me. For, I know, like, yeah, you mentioned, like, you know, you're an emotional eater. And I know so many of my friends are like, yeah that too so it's very uh different for I think each um individual and the word like diet you said it's just I that just creates a whole bunch of problems or issues on its own and I think now even um clinicians are realizing that you don't have to be a certain BMI to fit the criteria of a dis eating disorder or disordered eating like yes the DSM has changed its um criteria a little bit but now there's like before um Nikki you can correct me but before back in the it was either you were you know diagnosed with anorexia or and or bulimia but now there is so many 
you know, different titles to that. So it's not only A or B. Yeah, that's very true. They have, um, uh, they first added EDNOS, which was eating disorder not otherwise specified, which Mm -hmm. I guess mostly included people who just didn't fall under the category of anorexia or bulimia, people who didn't meet the weight criteria, um, also people who were compulsive overeaters. And then now they've added for compulsive overeating and they changed EDNOS to ARFRID, which I don't remember exactly what it stands for. I also wanted to comment on something you said about it being a lifetime struggle because that's so true. And with a lot of addictions or struggles that people have, um, in a lot of cases, you can fully avoid that thing or that's the goal to uh, fully avoid that thing. But you can't avoid food. You have to eat. So it's like an extra struggle there that you can't just have it gone from your life because you have to eat. Every day, it's like when you wake up, you know, it's like, well, you know, first, it depends how, you know, bad and thing it is, but, you know, really having you being in control and not the eating disorder voice being in control, right? That's me. They always, you know, teach your heads or like learn to, but it's always because there's going to be times when, and especially when you know what is going to be triggering to you or whatnot, like there's always going to be time in life where you might just go back to your old habits with, without not even realizing you're going back to your old habits because it's just your go-to. I briefly spoke about the fact that I didn't really have an eating disorder, but I was very, very underweight because of my heart condition. And I wasn't skinny shamed by people in school or people, you know, or my friends or anything like that. I was skinny shamed by doctors. Doctors assumed that because I was so thin that I was anorexic. And so I was like talked down to and almost yelled at by um, an endocrinologist, I believe, at Sick Kids back in 1995. And I was told, you know, if I was threatened that if you don't start eating, that this is what's going to happen, we're going to put a tube in your stomach. And we're going to have to make sure that you're getting fed overnight, in addition to your what you're eating during the day, because you're not eating enough. And that wasn't the issue. The issue was I couldn't take in enough food, I just couldn't possibly take in enough food to keep my heart, you know, not burning the calories that it was burning. I was just, I would stand up from the table, 100 calories would drop right there. And I mean, I think that Kia, you can sort of relate a bit in this area because yes. this is, I would just burn calories like that. And, you know, what happened was I ended up going to a different clinic a couple of days later. It was for my, my lung issues. And I remember my respirologist saying, you know, actually a tube in your stomach isn't the worst thing that could happen to you. And we know you're not anorexic, but you know, this is the ways it can actually help you. And when they reframed it, it didn't seem as menacing. And I ended up being tube fed every night for 10 years from age 11 to 21. Um, So, you know, in the end, but, but unfortunately, because I had the negative influence of you got to eat, you got to gain weight, you got to eat, I would force myself to eat a lot of the time. And that would lead to throwing up. And then I developed my, that's sort of how I developed my emetophobia. And that's when I started developing pickier habits, because I was afraid something I was going to eat was going to make me throw up. And this has continued till this day. It was, it haunted me all through my pregnancy, even though I don't have that issue anymore where I'm burning calories like that. I keep them on now. But um, I think what I wanted to ask is kind of how skinny shaming uh, is different from fat shaming and how can doctors and other medical professionals really improve on, you know, giving us confidence and, and helping us when we need it. I think what, uh, what they need to do again, it's, it's about, reframing or or breaking down the, the the stigmatism of what is too skinny what is fat because again everything's subjective but again the shame like stop shaming because as you mentioned things are changing so you know it, it's all about you know they should emphasize nutrition not diet you should be eating a certain amount or you shouldn't or you not be sh- not eating a certain amount I mean, again, I, I, it's understandable if, let's say, there's uh, pre-existing medical conditions where you have to have a specific, I'll have to use that word again, quote unquote, diet, which I hate that word, or, or type of nutrition program, I'll use that instead. Like, the, for example, diabetics, so they have restrictions. That's acceptable. Or again, if you're, you know, if you have goals, okay, fine. If you have a goal of attaining 
you know, again, muscle mass, but doing it healthily, not, you know, again, nothing wrong with consulting with a nutritionist or, or your doctor. But again, they, they have to stop with the, 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 the shaming or the stereotyping because there is, you know, what is, again, I'm going to put out there, what is too skinny? It's subjective. Mm-hmm. What is too fat? Because again, if you're com- coming from a cultural perspective, again, if you're, I'm going to bring it back to the Caribbean culture, or even, you know, you look at, you know, Polynesian cultures where a woman who is voluptuous or quote unquote, I'll just use the word overweight, that's revered as beautiful. Um, mm-hmm. Doesn't mean they're not healthy. So they really have to start thinking about stop looking at the the outer appearance to assess health. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree with mm-hmm. Kia. That is such an important thing and such a good point that they need to stop looking at you know your weight as an indicator of health. And unfortunately, it is something that happens a lot. Um, there's actually many studies done that have shown that fat people are not getting the care that they need because in a lot of cases, doctors will just start talking about their weight instead, or they'll start blaming weight instead of looking at the problem, which I've actually had experience lately. I went into my doctor for nothing that had to do with weight. And her first words were, well, you need to lose weight. And it had nothing to do with the problem, but that was her focus. And also, um, I'm just going to touch on what you were saying, the difference between fat shaming and skinny shaming, which I definitely think is different in different parts of the world. In Western culture, I know for sure that because, you know, thin bodies are valued, um, I know people do get skinny shamed and that's terrible. And Jackie, what you went through was awful. And I don't want to negate anyone's experience because those experiences are so important and they're, you know, body shaming in any form is just not okay. But I think the difference is that there are factors in society that really do discriminate against fat bodies because There are a lot of views, often negative, associated with them. So Mm -hmm. over studies they've done, they show that fat people make less money for the same job. Fat people are less likely to be hired. They're less likely to receive the medical treatment that they deserve. So there's all these issues that come along with it that don't necessarily come with someone who is straight sized or skinny. So, I mean, in your case, Jackie, you didn't get the med- the medical help you should have gotten because they were accusing you of having an eating disorder. And I think that really that's more of the exception to the rule rather than something that happens like as much as with someone who's fat. So like, I, again, I don't want to take away from anyone's experience because body shaming in any form is not okay. But there are some differences in Western culture with skinny shaming and fat shaming. That is really something that when someone posts something fat positive or body positive, people often come back with, but I was skinny shamed. What's the difference? The, the difference is also too, is that what I've, you know, stuff that I've researched, I've done is that Uh, you know, somebody who's skinny shamed does not necessarily have to pay for an extra seat on an airplane. Uh, That's, that's true too. Like society is built for skinny bodies and that's the ideal. And that's what people, I guess, want to attain in general, not everybody, but want to attain. And um, it isn't attainable for everybody. It's just not. And I mean, you know, it's, It's really sad to see the lack of knowledge or the lack of support that a lot of people get because a lot of people, especially on social media, anything fat positive, body positive is immediately jumped on, but you're being unhealthy. Your body's unhealthy. It's, you know, people are told that they, 
their body is gross. They shouldn't look like that, you know, and it's such a negative thing and it shouldn't, it just shouldn't be happening at all. It's really true. And I think we touched on a lot of good points. And I think the main thing is just talking about it and talking about there are, you know, there's embracing different body uh, shapes and sizes at the end of the day, like we all come in different shapes and sizes, you know, some are tall, some are skinny, like, and it's just a matter of embracing your body and who you are um, as a person. And I think also, I just want to say like, you know, I guess I kind of been there. It's like, well, I'm not too sick to, you know, get help um, or I'm not skinny enough to get help. And that's not the case. If you feel that you might be struggling with the eating disorder or disordered eating or, you know, very um, worried about like gaining weight or obsessed with food, seek help. You're not, you're not going to be too skinny or too um, overweight to get the help. So don't, think um in that sense that is just your ed voice just trying to get you out of you getting the help that you need and i think um there are a lot of great groups out there now that is more accepting and more open to diff- all different types and shapes of body and you don't have to fit this um criteria of you know one or the other in order to get the help that you that you need i was going to to speak on the again because I've, I've been skinny shamed but even with the fat shaming that it's um especially when you see um uh, hopefully people will will stop and really realize that again everything's subjective um fat which again some people you know that's a, that's the uh, identity they choose to that that word they they use it to empower themselves. Um, but there are, again, all bodies are, are beautiful. Um, again, I've seen women, I don't like to use the word fat. So, you know, full figured who are agile, they're yoga instructors, they are personal trainers. And the thing is that body type should be accepted, especially in the fitness industry, where, again, when you, it's based on aesthetic, where, again, we have to dismantle that aesthetic of being, you know, the North American European standard of being slender or, you know, lean, where again, you could be a thicker, curvier person and still be a a fabulous trainer, best physical health than the the norm, which is the the acceptable norm of, of of a slender or skinnier person. 